before we talk about God, before we talk about the Holy Spirit, we talk, before we talk about Scripture, before we talk about anything, I need to know your strength and I need to know your weakness. Why is it? Why? Well, let me talk about strength. Number one, there's an author by the name of uh, uh, Jake, what's his name? Ja, uh, uh, the author's name is Marcus Buckingham. And Marcus Buckingham, he has a book, and the book is called this. Listen to what it's called. It says, Now Discover Your Strengths. And this is what the author writes in this book. He says that most organizations are built on two things that are flawed when it concerns building businesses. Most organizations, they are built on these two things that are flawed. Number one, most organizations believe that you can teach anybody anything and they will be competent at it. And that is not true. It's not true. It's not true. The key word there is competent. What does it mean to be competent? When something is competent, listen to the definition, it is suitable for the purpose when you are competent in something. And what many of us, even in church, we believe that you can teach anybody anything and they will be competent at it. And that is not true. We can teach you how to do something and you may be able to just to hold the spot, but it doesn't mean that you will be competent at it. OK, let me, let me break this down to you. I, I, I am a man that, that, that I'm not a, a big sports person, but but but, you know, I like watching basketball. I like basketball. I, I, I really do. I love NBA. I really like watching NBA basketball. But here's the thing. You can teach me all day. How to play. And I'll be good enough, possibly, for a little team around here in the city, but I'll never make it to the NBA. I just won't make it to the NBA. I know for some of you, they'll say, well, but we can do all things through Christ. It didn't say you can be competent in all things through Christ. It said you can do all things through Christ. So although you can teach me how to be a ball player, I'll never make it to the NBA. And here's the problem with many of us in church. And then I'll never really fulfill the purpose of it. OK, see, see, because the purpose of it is to bring edification and to reach a certain point. We, t we had this discussion. There's a team by the name of the uh, 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 Golden State Warriors. And, and last year they had a Christian coach who was a pastor by the name of Mark Jackson. And they fired Mark Jackson last year right at he brought them all the way to the playoffs. But then they brought in another man by the name of Steve Kerr and they won the championship. Now, for many of us, we would think, well, Mark Jackson, he was OK. Yeah, but he wasn't competent at it. See, the thing that had been said about Mark Jackson is one thing when Steve Kerr came, the first thing Steve Kerr did is he went to the players' houses, even when they were out of town. He flew to their houses and he met with them. One of the issues that they said of Mark Jackson was he wasn't a people person. Although anybody, you, you can have the anointing but still not be a people person. You can be good at something but still not have what it takes to go to the next level. And what we want to do is we wanted to make sure, I wanted to make sure that everybody around me understood that it is not just about being okay in something, but it is being competent in it. It is finding your lane, finding what you're good at, finding your strength, and then getting good at it. The second thing that the author writes that most businesses fail upon when they're thinking is they think that you grow from growing from your weaknesses. And that's not true. You don't grow from getting better at your weaknesses, really. You grow from getting better at your strengths. What am I saying? What are you saying, Pastor, that I should not acknowledge my weaknesses? No, not at all. You should acknowledge your weaknesses and you should deal with your weaknesses. But what you must understand is that when you want to go to the next level, you've got to find your strength and become good at what you're good at and then become so good. There's an author by the name of Robert Kiyosaki. He's the author of a book called Rich Dad Poor Dad. In his second book, Cash Flow Quadrant, this is what Robert Kiyosaki said. He said, find out what you'll do for free and become so good at it that people will pay you to do it. Okay, y'all, y'all, y'all didn't get that. Some of y'all didn't get that. Find out what you good at. And then get so good at it that you get paid to do it. Okay, y'all, so I'm, I ain't talking to baby. Find out what you're good at. And then become so good at it. Some of y'all just some people person. Well, you ought to go to a job where you get to talk to people. And then become the best at it that they've ever seen, that they've ever known, that they've, they've ever, and get to the point that they say, you know what, we're going to have to pay you more. He said, find, uh, am I talking to anybody in the house? He says, find out. Now, here's another thing. When you acknowledge, when you know your strength, this is what happened. Number one, you become more productive and more happier in your life. When you operate, when you flow in your strengths, you're more productive. When you operate in your strengths, you're happier. When you operate in your strengths, you are better at something. You're better at doing it. You're better at it. Amen. 
And what you want to do, we want you to be productive. Number two, this is what happens when you operate. When you operate in your strengths, this is what happens. Your growth becomes and you begin to get stronger when you operate in your strengths. That's what we want to do. Now, here's the thing. So, 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 Pastor, that sounds good. That sounds great. And all that you just said was wonderful and awesome, Pastor. But, 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 but Pastor, then, if that's the case, then, why would you tell somebody then to learn to, uh, to, uh, to, to even acknowledge their weaknesses? Because here's the thing that you got to understand about weaknesses. If you never acknowledge your weaknesses, you're never going to go to the next level. You don't have to focus on your weaknesses, but you must at least acknowledge your weaknesses. You must acknowledge those things that you're not good at. You must acknowledge those things that you know. Like, who, how, how, let's, okay, let's be honest. How many of y'all know, look, don't put me in the children's ministry. Just, just don't put me in the children's ministry. That ain't, that ain't my calling. Just don't, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Amen? Don't, I am not the person to put in the children's ministry. Because this is a different time. You know what I mean? Y'all are on TV, they have channel 3, 5, 13, and they'll make up some channels. We have you out there. You, you, out, you in there beating the children and throwing them. Let, I said sit down. Because that's not your strength. Amen? Anybody know what I'm talking about? That's not your strength. So you got to, and when, you, when you acknowledge your weaknesses, it makes you also you're more productive. Here's what happens when you, acknowledge, when you acknowledge your weaknesses. It gets you out of situations where you cannot make a real impact. When you acknowledge your weaknesses, you say, you know what? Here's the thing. Anybody but me, too many of us have been existing, but we have not been competent. We're existing, but we're not competent. And when you're competent at something, there is something that happens that there is productivity in your life. There is things that are happening. You're getting better. That is even anybody. anybody, Everybody look at me. Even at your job. I need you to understand the teachings that I'm giving you. They are not just for church. They are for your life. And when you find your strength, you will be better at your job. Here's the thing that happens, number two. Number two, this is what happens. When you acknowledge your weaknesses, it makes you better for being a team player. It makes you to be a better team player. This is what I mean by that. When you acknowledge your weaknesses, you have no problem with somebody else coming up and doing something better that you're not good at. When you acknowledge your weaknesses. Once again, once again, I am not saying... Harp on your weaknesses. I am saying acknowledge them. And then what happens is you become a better team player because you have no problem in saying I passed the baton on this one because that's not my strength. So although, Pastor, I may have been the person that was in here painting the walls and, yeah, we got it done. But Brother Johnson is an architect and he has his own painting business. I will happily give him the brush. And now, 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 hear, hear me. That doesn't mean that once you give Brother Johnson the brush, you go sit down and do nothing. You go find out your strength. And then you ride in that strength. Am I making sense today? Number three, this is what happens when you acknowledge your weaknesses. It keeps you from being frustrated. It keeps you from being frustrated. It keeps you from being. Some of you right now, you're frustrated and you don't know why. You're frustrated because you are a square peg in a round circle and it's not working. And God is saying, you've got to find those things that are your strengths, and you've got to flow in that, in your life. Anybody, you know what, something, I, I don't know who said this, somebody said this to me week, this week. You, 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 you really don't work eight hours a day. I don't know if you know that. You really don't work eight hours a day. You don't work eight hours. Anybody that works nine to five, everybody here that has a job, you do not work eight hours a day. Let me break it down to you. At night, you have to get prepared for the job. Let's say about an hour. It's nine. In the morning, you've got to get up. To be there at 9, you've got to get up at 7.30. Yeah, that's another two hours. On the way home, you've got to drive another hour, hour and a half. You've just given them about 14 hours of your life. And what you've got to understand is that's the place where you're spending most of your time. And if you're frustrated at your job, it will play over into your life. You'll start being unhappy in everything because the thing where you spend most of your time has now frustrated you. And now, anybody, come on now, anybody know what I'm talking about? And now your whole life is frustrated, not because of anything, but it's that one situation at your job where you're frustrated. And when you find your flow, it helps you stop from being frustrated. But here's the main thing I want to talk about. Number four, when you acknowledge your weaknesses, it helps you to be real. When you acknowledge your weaknesses, it helps you to be real. 
One, one, one of the issues, one of the issues, anybody but me, one of the issues I believe, and I, I, I'm, 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 my mic is messing with me, I don't know what it is, but, but, but the, I, I got to preach this thing. One, 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 one of the things right now that I think is the biggest concern that I see in the body of Christ, really, at church, it can, at times, we've got to be careful that it's not real. We present this image of God and this image of Christianity and this image of church that you've got to be perfect. You've got to walk this way. You've got to look this way. And some of us, we're more concerned about our image and less concerned about being real with God. Let me give you a secret. It's not like he doesn't already know. God already knows where you mean it. God already knows where you gossip at. Now, God already knows what you're doing wrong, and there's no need in trying to fool us. And let me really bless some of you, because some of us have a relationship with God, and he gives us a spirit of discernment that we know you before you even know yourself. But we've got to be real with God. We've got to learn to be real. And in the church, at times, we're not real. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's just not real. Just not it, it, you. You feel like you you got to be perfect for God to use you. It, it, you you feel like you got to have it all together for God to use you. Can I mess you up? Noah was a drunk. Moses stuttered. Abraham was too old. Sarah laughed at God. Jacob was a liar. Elijah dealt with depression. Gideon was afraid. Samson was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah was suicidal. Jonah ran from God. Job went bankrupt. David committed adultery. Zacchaeus was too short. Peter denied Jesus three times. Paul was a murderer. Thomas didn't believe the resurrection. And Lazarus just plain died. And if God can use all of them people that I just read, baby, he can use you. 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 Because the presentation that church gives you is that you have to be perfect for God to use you. It's not true. What is the church? Is the church a building? Is the church a pastor? Or the staff? Is the church the music, the tradition, or the ministries? These are all good things, but they are not the church. Take them away, and the church is still here. Why? Because you are still here. The church is you. The church is you with a purpose. The church is you on a mission. The church is you with a plan, a simple plan to plug into God at a weekend service, to charge up in a small group community, to live out using your gifts and passions, and to pass on your faith to those who do not know Christ. When you and I live like this, all the things we used to do in church become things we do as the church. God desires it. The world needs it and we are called to be it. What is the church? The church is you. You cannot be real today. Can I just really preach this thing like I want to? A lot of you are dealing with depression and stuff and the church put it on you. Because we made you feel like you got to have this level of faith. You got to be this. You, you got to be this perfect. You got to be this. You got to be that. Instead of just saying, all of us in here jacked up. I just cover mine up better than somebody else. I said I wasn't going to preach hard. Let me get back into this thing. And we present this image of Jesus that's just not real. We present this image of church 
that's just not real. And we come in here and we're all presenting images to each other instead of being real with each other, instead of being honest with each other, instead of being transparent with each other. This is why I love the word of God so much. I, you know what? I'm at a point where I read the Bible and I study the Bible from a different level. I, I, you, you can read the Bible from a topical situation, from a topical standpoint when you're studying, meaning that you can study faith. and You can go in and you can begin to read every subject of faith and you'll pull up every scripture that concerns faith and you'll look it up and you'll read it and you'll study it. But I'm at a different place in my walk with God. I just love reading, reading about real people that messed up. I love it. I, it is. That's why I love Moses so much. And you know, those of you who don't know, and I talked about this last Sunday at the other church, Moses was, was an orphan. His mama and dad, his, we don't even know his, his daddy wasn't even there. It sounded like a ghetto tragedy. Daddy gone, and mama sent him up the river. Sound like a reality show to me right now. Amen. Amen. But yet and still, and he stuttered. And he messed up. And he ran. And he killed somebody. And God still said, You my man. Real talk, it's not God that's keeping some of you down. You've been beat up so long that when God says, You the one, you like, but mama said I couldn't do this. But daddy said I couldn't do this. But even the preacher told me I wasn't good enough. And God is saying, you my man, you my woman, you the one I call. Because we've been told so long what we're not. And nobody's ever told us what we are. I don't want to tell you what you're not. I want to tell you what you are. So you can be it, do it, and become it. That's why I love the Bible. I, 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 don't, I don't think y'all understand. I love this book. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love reading the Bible. I, and, and, and even, uh, my, y'all pray for me. My wife, she, she, she's even got me watching. My wife will watch, like, biblical stories. Like, wasn't you watching this uh, three hours ago? Oh, no, this is about Jacob. I'm like, I love the Lord. He heard my cry. But can we put it on something else? But, but, you, but it's very intriguing when you watch biblical stories on TV because you'll go to watch it and like, wow. Wow, that's really intriguing. And I love it. I love it. I love it. And let me tell you something about God that is so vitally important that I need you to understand. Who am I preaching to today? Let me tell you what God will do. I want you to know that some of you, you're dealing with this, but God wants you to be set free and delivered. And there are so many people in the church today that are sick. Sick. Let me bless you right now because I don't want you to feel bad. And so was I. Watch this. Proverbs chapter 13. Let me read this to you if you don't have it. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12. There are a lot of people, man of God, woman of God, that are sick in church, unhappy. And I'm going to show you why. Proverbs 13, verse 12. Listen to this. Listen to this. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Okay. But when desire comes, it is a tree of life. Okay. Hear me. Watch me. Watch me. There are a lot of you in here today. You're sick. And let me tell you why. God, ain't, I, you know what? I feel like preaching. I'm trying to put this thing together. I don't care what you say. You can present how you, we super holy and super this, but when God show you how your life's supposed to be and you don't see that happen, you'll get sick. Am I talking to anybody in here today? God showed you you're supposed to have your own business and you still at McDonald's, you'll get sick. I don't care how much faith you got. I don't care how much jumping you do. I don't care how much shouting you do. God showed you you're supposed to have a wonderful marriage. Y'all ain't even getting along. And if you're not careful, it'll start to take your energy. It'll start to take your joy. It'll start to take your peace. It'll start. And before you know it, you going through the motions. Your energy's gone. Your passion's gone. Your fire's gone. Not because there's anything other, but God showed me this right here, and I don't see it. God 
God showed me this and it's not happening. God showed me this. And I've been in this for one year. They told me two years. They, 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 at the last New Year's service, they told me it was going to be my year. And, and I went to this conference and they told me it was going, it was going to happen. And I sowed my seed. And I'm praying. And I'm shouting. And I'm ministering. And I'm helping people. And other people's houses being blessed, but mine ain't. And I'm trying to serve God. And they telling me this is how you ought to do it. And they don't have a clue what's going on in my life. And, and, and now, I didn't just start to go through the motions. Praise the Lord. Yeah, hallelujah. One, two, three, give a shout, yay. But deep down inside, man, I'm sick. I'm sick to my stomach. The reason why, Elder, I can preach this is because I lived it. See, I, I, I'm at the point, too, for me, I preach the Bible from a reality standpoint. I don't like people. Don't preach the Bible to me and make, and make it, I feel like ain't nothing in there I can touch. I, give, give me some reality stuff that makes me feel that this is doable. And I want to be honest with you right now. You can be up here preaching, worshiping, Singing, jumping, shouting, praising, sowing, and be sick at the same time. Sick. And I've been there. And let me tell you what happens. Because when you not seeing come to pass what you know God told you, it'll mess with you. You go to doubt God. Did I hear God? Is his voice real? Is he there? See, let me, can I, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me bless you with something. Let me bless you with something. When we came from the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 3, and then we went into Matthew chapter 4, and the Bible talks about how Jesus went into the wilderness. There's another situation that the wilderness came about. It's when the children of Israel and God told Moses, you're going to Canaan, the promised land, and then they go through the wilderness. Can I bless y'all with something in here today? Can I give you something that's going to make you good? When God gives you a vision, the next thing that's going to come is the wilderness. Because the wilderness represents the testing. And what can happen if you're not careful you will focus on the wilderness instead of your promise. Yes, sir. Can I be real? Can I preach this thing today? And sometimes in life, the only thing that will keep you going is a promise. That's why you got to have a promise that's so deep down inside of you that mama can't talk you out of it. That daddy can't talk you out of it. That your husband can't talk you out of it. That your wife can't talk you out of it. You got to have something on the inside. The old folks used to say, if, if mama forsake me, if daddy forsake me, if all of y'all in here leave, I still believe what God told me. And it's that wilderness. Here's, here's the thing about the wilderness. When Jesus goes into the wilderness, he goes through a series of tests. He, he goes through a series of tests. And, 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 and anybody with me, let me, let me bless y'all with something. For those of you who haven't made it there yet, the wilderness is a place where God's voice is very light, very slim. Oh, come on now. Because the wilderness represents a dry place. And in the wilderness, see, the wilderness represents, see, in the wilderness, you have to depend on God. Anybody but me, you have to depend on God for your money, for your sanity, for your food, for your emotional. Okay, see, here's the thing. We don't deal with emotional standpoints in the church of the emotional process because the psychological process is just as powerful as the spiritual process when it concerns us as human beings. Because as human beings, we are three facets. We are mind, body, and spirit. 
Well, family, that is all the time we have for you today. I pray that you are receiving the word of God. I pray that the word of God is changing your life and revolutionizing the way that you think. I need you to know that none of us have a monopoly on God. Not the pastor, not the preacher, not the deacon, not the elders. None of us have a monopoly on God. I often say, if you get in the Jesus line, you might see me in front of you because all of us need Jesus. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to know that what we do is all for you. Everything that we do is for you. It is that you may be encouraged. It's, made you, it's that you may be edified. It's that the word of God can change your life. I want you to know you may have a good marriage, but it can be a great marriage. You may have an okay financial picture, but it can be a better financial picture. You may be the CEO, but you can be the business owner. I want you to know that God has things that are so great in store for you. He's just waiting for you to give him your all. Give him your everything and surrender your all, your strength, your mind, your finances. He wants you to surrender everything to him that he can take you to a level that you never even dreamed of. God bless you. We'll see you next time.